So now that we've spent a lot of time thinking about different types of research designs, what variables are, correlation, experiment, things like that, we haven't tackled ethics yet, though. And so that's what we're going to do in this lecture. It's important when we're conducting research that we are being ethical to our participants. And so what this ultimately means is minimizing the harm done to our participants in any way that we can. And ethical issues are so important. Um, but the need to run ethically sound studies wasn't always at the forefront of researchers' minds. Um, there's actually a few commonly cited studies which really built the foundation for today's ethical practice in research. Um, you may have heard of some of these. There was the Tuskegee study of African-American men living in rural Alabama with syphilis, um, which I believe your book talks about. There's also Philip Zimbardo's prison study, which we will talk much more about when we get to social psychology. For today, I want to talk in depth about another famous, famous example, and that is Stanley Milgram's study of obedience. And so I'm going to go slightly out of order here. Um, Milgram conducted his research in July 1961. It was three months after the start of the trial of German Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann. And so Milgram's ultimate research question or research interest was, um, did Eichmann and his accomplices perform the atrocities of the Holocaust because they were just following orders? In other words, he was curious about when good people do bad things because they're told to do so by an authority figure. So I'll just give you a brief rundown, and then I'm going to show you a video that has uh, actually some footage from the original study. So what you'll see is that there's an experimenter, that's the researcher. Um, the experimenter will order the teacher, who's actually the participant, um, to give what he believes are painful electric shocks to a learner. Now, the learner is actually a confederate or an actor hired by the research team. Okay. So they'll bring in these two individuals. Only one is actually a participant. They will choose from a hat to see who's going to be the teacher or the learner, but it is rigged. The participant will always pull that they are the teacher. And they're then separated. They're put in two different rooms. The teacher can't see the learner. The learner can't see the teacher. So the participant, the teacher, is told that for every wrong answer the learner gives on, on a word task, um, the teacher is going to give them a shock. And that shock is going to move up in gradual, gradual intensity. Now, it's all fake. There were no shocks. Okay? But the participant, the teacher, doesn't know that. And so there's a tape recorder that is playing pre-recorded sounds for each shock level. So it starts off pretty innocently, but you'll start to hear the learner getting more and more distressed, saying things like, please stop, um, I can't go on. And eventually the learner just stops responding altogether and there's silence. And so the question is, how far will the teacher go in administering those shocks? So let's take a look and we're going to jump back. In a unique period from... I would say at Yale University. The subjects are 40 males between the ages of 20 and 50 residing in the greater New Haven area. Psychologists have developed several theories to explain how people learn. One theory is that people learn things correctly whenever they get punished for making a mistake. Forty years later, Milgram's infamous experiment, Obedience, is still taught in classrooms around the world. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Teacher. All right, now the next thing we'll have to do is set the uh, learner up so that he can get some sort of punishment. What inspired Milgram, I would say there were a number of factors. One of them is he was very ambitious. He wanted to make a mark in social psychology. And he wanted, as he wrote to one friend, he wanted to come up with the most, with the boldest experiment that he could think of. Would you roll up your right sleeve, please? This electrode is connected to the shock generator in the next room. And this electrode paste is to provide a good contact to avoid any blister or burn. Do you have any questions now before we go into the next room? About two years ago, I was at the Veterans Hospital in West Haven. Mm -hmm. And while there, they detected a heart condition. There's nothing serious. But as long as I'm having these shocks, um, how strong are they? How dangerous are they? Well, no. Although they may be painful, they're not dangerous. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, that's all. 
All right, teacher, would you take the test and be seated in front of the shop? So this Confederate, this learner has now just disclosed that he has a heart condition, which is important. Doc generator, please, in the next room. But the experiment was rigged. The victim was an accomplice of the experiment. The victim, according to plan, provided many wrong answers. His verbal responses were standardized on tape, and each protest was coordinated to a particular voltage level on the shock generator. Now, as teacher, you were seated in front of this impressive-looking instrument, the shock generator. Its essential feature is a line of switches that goes from 15 volts to 450 volts, and a set of verbal designations that goes from slight shock to moderate shock, strong shock, very strong shock, intense shock, extreme intensity shock. And finally, XXX, danger, severe shock. Your job, the experimenter explains to you, is a word pair test. If he gets each answer correctly, fine, you move on to the next pair. But if he makes a mistake, you are instructed to give him an electric shock, starting with 15 volts. And you increase the shock one step on each error. Incorrect. You'll now get a shock of 105. Hard head. Just how far can you go in this thing? As far as is necessary. What do you mean as far as is necessary? Milgram was very much aware that obedience is a necessary ingredient for society to function. But he focused on the darker side of obedience. Incorrect. 150 volts. Sad face. That's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had a hard time. I heard it's going to bother me now. It's absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice, teacher. Oh, I have a lot of choices. My number one choice is that I wouldn't go on if I thought he was being harmed. Now, this man makes disobedience seem a very rational and simple deed. Now, other subjects respond quite differently to the experimenter's authority. Wrong. It's hair. 75 volts, Jim. Oh. <laughs> Please continue. Some psychologists were troubled by the ethics of it. Many, if not most subjects, found it a highly stressful, conflicted experience. People are stammering, stuttering, laughing hysterically and appropriately. 150 volts. Experiment. That's all. Get me out of here. Please. I can't quit. Oh, my hair's starting to bother me now. Get me out of here, please. Get me out of here. You have no right to be here. Let me out. Let me out of here. Let me out. Continue, please. Let me out of here. My eyes bother me. Let Go me on. out. Let me out. Clearly, you know, when we say people went to the top of the shock board, it wasn't like they were going blithely, sadistically. People went stop and go, stop and go. They were in a state of conflict, which was created a tremendous amount of stress. So that was the main critique. This will be at 3.30. As his voice began to show increasing frustration, uh, so did I. And I was really in a state of uh, real conflict and agitation. One of Stanley Milgram's basic contributions was that you don't ask people what they would do given this hypothetical situation. You put them in the situation. Wrong. Please continue, teacher. 180 volts. Stand I'm not going to kill that man. Yeah. Milgram, one of the things that's a prerequisite for carrying out acts that are evil is to shed responsibility from your shoulders and, and hand it over to the person in charge. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one. Slow. He didn't hold any gun to anybody's head. Just the fact that he conveyed a sense of authority. Roughly 60, 65 percent of the people went all the way to the top of the shock board. 450 volts. That's it. Now continue using the last switch on the board, please. The 450 switch for each wrong answer. Continue, please. I'm not getting no answer. Don't the man's health mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not, we but must. But he might be dead in there. Milgram made the point, I think, very effectively that the Nazis were all a bunch of psychopaths at Belsen and Dachau. Half a death camp from the middle class in New Haven. Well, who was actually pushing the switch? I was. But he kept insisting. I told him no, but he said he's got to keep going. 
What kind of obedience would Milgram get today? So pretty intense stuff, right? Um, and the takeaway is that people do what they're told when they're told to do so by an authority figure. And so the findings reveal that 65% of participants would deliver the max level of shock in most of the conditions. That's a pretty high number of participants. Okay. Um, did you notice anything about the participants' behavior? How were they reacting? I always like the one guy who's laughing, right? So the they hear the, the grunting, the sounds of, of pain from the other person and you and the participant is laughing. It may seem sort of weird, but we'll talk more about this when we get to emotion and motivation in a couple of weeks. Sometimes when you're in an uncomfortable situation and you don't know what to do, you do that or nervous laughter. We saw a lot of that. We saw a lot of shifting body language, right? So this person was clearly uncomfortable. They kept asking to stop. Um, and yet they didn't. And so although Milgram studies taught us a lot about human behavior, Milgram really did a few key things wrong. Um, the study was potentially doing psychological or emotional harm to the participants. Like I said, they were getting visibly stressed. They were sweating, stuttering, shifting around in their seats. Um, it's not ethical to purposely create a prolonged situation where participants are so obviously uncomfortable. Now, what's interesting is that there's been follow-up work done, which found that there was no uh, significant lasting impact to Milgram's participants. That's a question that I often get from students. Are these participants sort of scarred for life? Answer is no. For the most part, they were fine afterwards. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's ethical to uh, pur purposely put people in such uncomfortable positions for such a long time. Another issue is that participants have the right to withdraw from a study at any time with no repercussions. Now, you all have to do SONA for this class. When you do SONA, which is the research participation, you will get a sheet of paper um, before you even start a study, or usually it's online, so you'll see a screen, and it will talk about what you're going to do in the study. Somewhere on that on that paper or on that screen, it will say something to the effect of, you may leave this study at any time with no consequences. Milgram messed up there. When the participant hesitated or asked to leave, the experimental responded with verbal prompts like, please continue. It is absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice. You must go on. Now, it's not, just to be clear, it's not that Milgram was purposely violating these ethical uh, issues. They didn't exist at the time. These, these ethical rules exist now partially in response to Milgram's work. But Milgram's study is a great example of the importance of monitoring research for ethical practices, also providing evidence for the value of conducting a risk-benefit analysis uh, prior to beginning a study. So we always have to think about the potential risks and benefits to our participant. The goal is to have a risk-benefit ratio that maximizes benefits while minimizing risks. So some of the obvious potential risks are physical harm. Say we're doing our good old clinical drug trial, people could experience painful or uncomfortable side effects. Or if we're doing a blood draw study, people could pass out, feel uncomfortable, something could go wrong with the blood draw. These are all physical risks. There's also the risk of psychological harm. Um, Milgram study is a good example here. The participants were clearly uncomfortable. They were clearly stressed. So although we know that there wasn't lasting impact, um, in the moment, they were still feeling very stressed. And this is something that we often see. I come across this a lot in my research on bullying, sexual victimization, things like that. We have to make sure that the questions we're asking are not causing undue harm. Saying we can't stress our participants out a little bit or make them a little bit uncomfortable, um, but we do just have to make sure everything balances, that the, the bit of discomfort they're experiencing is outweighed by the rewards of the study or the potential gains. There's also issues with breach of confidentiality. Okay? If it gets out that you took part in a certain study, that maybe could have repercussions for your life. Say you take part in a study on um, incarceration. 
And those data get leaked and it gets out to your employer or to your family that you were incarcerated. That could have impact on your life. So breach of confidentiality or, your, or the data getting out that you were uh, participating in that study can also be considered a risk. And so there's things that we have to do to make sure that we protect our participants' confidentiality. But there's also a lot of benefits to participating or conducting research as well. Again, starting with the most obvious, oftentimes you get a monetary reward or some sort of a prize for participation. Ever do a survey, then at the end, you can enter into a raffle. The winner will get an Amazon gift card or something like that. You can also gain knowledge. Participants are very commonly sent the findings of the studies they take part in. So they gain the knowledge that they were able to help contribute to. It's considered a benefit. And finally, there may be a sense of satisfaction from participating, or participation may feel personally meaningful to people. Um, when I was at Rowan doing research on sexual assault, one of the big issues that we had was that the review board, which we're going to talk about in a minute, was very concerned that letting us conduct research on sexual assault uh, was going to be stressful for our participants. And yes, absolutely. There are some evidence to suggest that. And uh, I, you know, just even thinking about it logically, I would imagine that answering questions about sexual assault could be triggering or harmful or traumatic to a sexual assault survivor. But there's actually been quite a bit of research in these, this area. And what's largely been found is that people who have experienced some sort of trauma um, actually don't feel worse after taking part in research on that area. They actually feel empowered. Um, they often feel like my experience, my awful experience or what I went through um, lets me take part in this project that may help someone else or may prevent someone else from having to go through what I went through. That's actually satisfying and it's deeply empowering. So I'm not saying that there's not going to be some discomfort or some stress, um, but this, that satisfaction, that empowerment often outweighs the risk. Every single study is going to have risks. There is no such thing as a 100% risk-free study. There's a range, there's a continuum for sure. Some studies are going to be more risky than others. Um, a study where you are intoxicating your participants and exposing them to sexual assault uh, lab paradigms is obviously way more risky than a survey asking about your favorite um, musical artist or your favorite band or, or whatever, um, but there's always some degree of risk. So how do you know whether the benefits outweigh the risks? There's no concrete answer here. It is a bit of a judgment call. Um, ultimately, what we're doing is this thing called a risk-benefit analysis, um, and our institutional review board can help us make this decision. In fact, they have to help us make this decision. This is not something we can decide by ourselves as researchers. So if you're wondering what the IRB is, about that next. The IRB stands for Institutional Review Board. Every federally funded school, university, uh, often hospitals, they're going to have this review board. And their job is to review research proposals and make sure they are ethical. The IRB is a team. It's a group of people. It rotates, um, but it's a group of people who are part of both the university and the community. So you'll have academics on the uh, IRB, people who are in academia who are doing research, but you'll also have community members. Maybe it's the local pastor or the local soccer coach or, uh, you know, just business people from the community. They're there to present the non-academic viewpoint, make sure that everything is uh, presented in ways that people would understand, um, and to just look at it from a completely different angle. The purpose of the IRB is for accountability. Their job is to help manage and maintain the APA ethical code. I'm not going to go too far into that in this class. You don't need to know the nitty gritty. Um, but the APA is the American Psychological Association. I did a link here to the code. If you're interested, you can check it out. Um, but the APA ethical code is the guidelines that we have to adhere to in terms of making sure that we are protecting our participants. The IRB is going to help us do that. This is very important. You have to receive approval before beginning a study. You cannot start your study and then get IRB approval. Um, you think of why? 
Ultimately, it's because the IRB, it's their job to help make sure that we're not doing anything harmful. If we start doing things first and then come to the IRB and they say, no, this protocol is problematic, we've already potentially hurt people. So you must receive approval before beginning a study. Um, if not, you will never get your study published. You can also likely get in trouble through your institutional review board. I have a link here to Holy Family's IRB. If you're interested, you can check that out. We have one since we have people doing research here. should also note that the IRB is just for human research. Uh, for animal research, there's a whole separate governing body. It's called IACUC. I never remember what it stands for. Um, Institutional Association for the Care and Use of Animals, something like that. I was going to say something else about the IRB. Oh, it'll come back to me. So no, I was going to say that every piece of information that you are going to expose your participants to has to be given to the IRB. Um, and so this is going to start with your statement of informed consent. Um, this is the process where you tell participants what you're asking them to do before you ask them to do it. And there's a few really important pieces here to consider. Participants have to be told the purpose of the study. They have to be told all steps of the protocol, so exactly what they're going to be asked to do. They have to be informed about the risks and benefits of participation, as well as how you're going to reduce the risk. So if a potential risk is that um, they may feel stressed out by the questions asked, the way that you're going to compensate for that risk maybe is by providing them with resources that they can read afterwards that might help them feel calmer. You have to tell participants if and how they'll be compensated and how their confidentiality will be protected. You also have to assure them that participation is voluntary and that they can leave at any time without any consequences. This is where Milgram fell short, one of the places Milgram fell short. You have to provide contact information for questions, usually yourself and your superior if you have one. And it's really important that the statement of informed consent be written in language that is clear to the participant. In academia, we tend to be a bit jargony. We tend to use terms or language that can be difficult to understand. That's not going to fly for the informed consent. The rule of thumb is to write it at about an eighth grade level. Okay, so if you gave it to an average eighth grader, they'd be able to read it and understand it. Sometimes it's also necessary to have your informed consent translated. Um, oftentimes, we have participants who speak multiple languages. So if you have participants, if you are recruiting participants who speak multiple languages, you have to be sure that the informed consent is in a language that they are able to understand. You would present all of your study materials to the uh, IRB as well. So all of your questionnaires, all of your surveys, any, um, if you're running them through any sort of like lab procedures, that has to be documented and sent to the IRB. You also have to justify deception if you use it. Deception is an active misrepresentation of information about the nature of the study, which is a nice way of saying we lie to our participants. Now, you may be sitting here thinking that we just spent this whole lecture talking about being ethical. Wouldn't lying to your participants count as being unethical? Depends on your research question. Sometimes we have to deceive our participants because if they know what we're really trying to do in our study, it would change their responses. The project that I worked on at Rowan, we were interested in looking at women's risk recognition. So when you're intoxicated, do you perceive risk differently than when you are sober? And so what we would do is we would bring them into the lab and we would tell them that they were going to be beta testing this speed dating software for us. They were going to be interacting with a man. He's down the hall in another research room at Rowan. Um, we, we are going to pair you up together. You're going to answer a bunch of questions um, and then you'll see his answers. And it, it's essentially a speed dating situation. Um, our question was, would the intoxicated women uh, react differently to this man? There was no man. It was fake. It was all made up, but they didn't know that um, compared to the sober women. Now, here's the thing. The male's responses were predetermined, just like in the Milgram study. They were predetermined. So it didn't matter what the woman said. He would say the same thing back. 
And his responses were be, were programmed to be more and more sexually harassing. So the beginning was pretty innocuous, but by the third or fourth response, he was saying some really pretty gross and slimy things. Um, by the end, he was really pretty actively harassing this woman. And so we were interested in when she would tap out and when she would stop engaging with this 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 man. If we told the truth and we said, we're interested in knowing how long you're going to engage with this fake guy, it would completely defeat the purpose of the study. It would completely change the way she responds. We needed to use what's called a cover story where we told her, hey, you're beta testing this speed dating software. That's believable um, and isn't going to cause participants to react in a way that could completely change the purpose of your study. Another example is a project that I did while I was an undergraduate. Uh, we were looking at behavioral mimicry. So we wanted to see if uh, a participant would mimic a certain behavior. In this case, we were looking at frowning. Well, I can't tell you that we're interested in how often you frown because that's going to make you very hyper aware of what your face is doing. We had to give a cover story. We gave them some sort of word task and we had them watch a video um, where the, the person in the video would frown and then we would record how often the person, the participant frowned. Okay, so sometimes we do have to lie to our participants um, for the good of the study. As part of your ethical guidelines, though, at the end, you're going to tell them that. You're going to tell them that you deceived them. You're going to tell them why. You're going to tell them the true purpose of the study um, and give them the opportunity to ask any questions um, and to have their data pulled if they want to. In my experience, people are not usually upset about being lied to. Honestly, often people find it really funny. Hey, they usually are really, really amused. Um, sometimes they'll say things like, oh, I, I thought... I thought something was weird, right? So, and, and then those are things that in your research you want to take into account. Maybe somebody didn't buy your deception. But anyway, my point being, you have to tell them at the end, pull their data if they want um, and have a conversation about it. And finally, the IRB is going to want to see your debriefing process. And so this is where you've got to check in with your participants at the end of the study. You provide more information. If you use deception, you tell them the true purpose and the reason for the deception. You'll discuss expected findings and practical implications. You give them the chance to ask any questions. But perhaps the most important part of the debriefing process is that it lets the researcher make sure the participant is physically and emotionally prepared to leave the lab setting. Um, this isn't a major issue if you're doing something routine. Um, same thing with an online study. You're not actually engaging with the researcher. But in the case of the alcohol study, we were actually intoxicating our participants. We were giving them quite a bit of vodka. And so as the researcher, as the experimenter, I needed to make sure that they were sober and not sick before I could let them leave the lab. I can't just let the person who I've intoxicated to, a, a, you know, point one. Uh, BAL, I can't just let them leave the lab and drive home. I have to make sure that they are sober enough. Um, I have to make sure that they have a ride, things like that. Okay. And so that's that's a big part of the debriefing process too, is to make sure you have eyes on your participant, um, if it's a, a protocol that requires that. We talked earlier about uh, breaches in confidentiality as a potential risk, um, but I'm wondering if you know the difference between confidentiality and anonymity. Confidentiality is where we keep personal information private. So this is where we collect information on the participant's uh, name, their demographic information, their uh, birthdays, things like that. But then we eventually separate it out. And so um, in my dissertation research, we did collect our participants' names because we needed it for one of the process, the protocols that we were doing. So what we would eventually do once we had all of the data entered is that we would assign each participant a code. We would remove their name from the main database. So then the participant was only assigned by a number. This way, uh, if that data gets leaked, there's no harm to the participant. There would be one master file that would link up the names and the codes because we needed to know who was who. Um, but oftentimes you will lock that in. You can password protect files. You can password protect computers. You can lock laboratory spaces. And so all of those measures would be put in place to protect confidentiality. But then there's anonymity. This is where we never knew the information. Okay, so if you're doing a phone survey or something like that, um, or if you're even if you're just doing a survey where you're not giving your name or birthday or things like that. 
So confidentiality, we have the information. We are just taking steps to keep it private. In anonymity, we never had the information. Which one do you think is safer? Definitely anonymity because the there's no way for information to get leaked since we don't have the information. So anonymity is preferable when possible. And finally, just a quick word on autonomy. Your participants have to be able to give consent to participate. There's a group of participants who are unable to consent for various reasons. Children, okay, so children are not able to consent. They have not reached the cognitive level to be able to make that decision for themselves. Children under 18, I should say. Uh, in same, same thing with people who are cognitively impaired. So anybody who has a developmental disability, people with autism, Down syndrome, um, they are not able to give consent. Psych psychiatric patients, okay, who are, who may struggle to understand things, um, and prison inmates, although there isn't necessarily a cognitive impairment, um, there are issues with, um, the next piece, which is coercion. Okay, so force, pressure. Um, we can't force people to take part in research, but due to the uh, incarceration structure, it would be way too easy to sort of force uh, incarcerated people to take part in research. And so we have to be really careful there. Now, I'm not saying we can't do research on those populations. I'm just saying they can't consent for themselves. And there tends to be lengthier protocols involved in getting research done on these populations. So you need to have a parent or a guardian give consent. Um, when I was doing my dissertation research, we had to, uh, we were looking at adolescent middle schoolers. And so we had to send home consent forms to the parents. The parents had to send them back. Um, it was, it's a, it's a big process. It's a, a lot more work than just being able to hand an adult a survey um, and a consent form and they can consent for themselves. Um, and just one last point about co coercion, we have to think about incentives as well. Incentives are great and they help incentivize people to take part in the research, but we have to make sure that they're not too, um, not too strong. For example, you're all college students. I'd imagine that most of you would describe yourselves as broke. Um, if I said I'm doing a study and I'm going to pay you $500 an hour to do whatever it is, that's a lot of money. You might not want to take part in that study. You might not feel comfortable with what you're being asked to do, but that's an awful lot of money to pass up. So you might be more inclined to do the thing, um, even if you don't feel right doing it. That is an example of a, an incentive that is coercive. So we have to make sure that our incentives are strong enough to be able to provide participants um, a value for their time, but not so strong that we might put people in an uncomfortable situation where they feel like they can't pass up this opportunity. Um, and so in conclusion, ethics are important. We have to make sure that we are treating our participants well. Um, in our next lecture, we're going to talk about how we evaluate research. Not all research is created equal, and so we have to think about some of the ways that we do our research to make sure that everything is coming out um, and saying what we expect it to say. We'll see you then.